and welcome to another episode of Chicago This Week. I'm your host, Bailey Eichner. The stories in today's episode all relate to the environment. From green technology to environmental advocacy, we'll be taking a look at how Chicagoans are doing their part to create a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. This first story is about a bird, Monty the famous piping plover, who first arrived in the city three years ago, died earlier this month. Members of Chicago's birding community came together in a memorial to commemorate his life and legacy. Here's Rafael Hipos. The heavy rain last May 25 didn't stop dozens of people from gathering at Montrose Beach to commemorate the life of Monty, the famous piping plover who died on May 13. Monty was almost five years old, which is the typical lifespan for a piping plover, though many were still caught off guard by his death. It was quite a shock. I, uh, I actually was out of the country on vacation, and I, that was one day that I did have internet, was able to get the notice from Tamina, but also my neighbors were, were emailing me that, I don't know if you heard, but, so it's like this huge bit of news. Monty and his partner Rose first landed on Montrose Beach three years ago. On June 3rd of 2019, I observed the male, Monty, uh, scrape a nest. Uh, and then the next morning, um, a few of us observed Monty and Rose court and then mate. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we knew there was a nest. Two days later, we saw an egg, and that's when we knew that, for real, they were nesting here at Montrose. The two piping plovers were the first pair to nest in the city since the 50s. When Monty and Rose arrived, it was mostly disbelief. <laughs> it was one of those things where uh, nobody saw that coming, nobody predicted that. And then even as it sort of started to unfold, it was almost still kind of an unreal experience. Since then, the pair have taken the city by storm. A music festival that was supposed to happen in 2019 was canceled in order to protect the birds, and the Chicago Park District designated three acres of beach land as a protected area for them. In front of us here is um, was actually where the volleyball sand the sand volleyball course used to be, and the first year uh, we actually had to line up as monitors and prevent volleyballs from rolling over to the to Monty and Rose's nest. Monty and Rose were able to fledge seven chicks during their time in Montrose. Despite his passing, members of the birding community believe that Monty's legacy will continue to live on. Monty and Rose have had such a dramatic impact on conservation in Chicago in just that uh, they, they set a standard and a bar that we didn't even realize there was to be set. Imani, one of Monty and Rose's chicks who was born last year, has returned to the city after a brief stop in Minnesota. He continues to stay here in Montrose Beach, though he has yet to find a mate. To learn more about conservation efforts here in Chicago, I talked to Judy Pollock of the Chicago Audubon Society. Take a look. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Oh, thank you so much for doing this. It's great to be here with you. Right. So, uh, Judy, could you just tell me first about your organization? What does the Chicago Audubon Society do? The Chicago Audubon Society is a chapter of, you know, volunteer-led chapter of the National Audubon Society and we engage people with birds and we also work on local bird conservation projects. When people think about big cities, they don't instantly think about birds. Can you talk about the bird population here in Chicago? Yes, that's a great question, so thanks for asking it. Many, many birds migrate up the middle of the country. You got few birds here in winter, then they all come pouring in and also pouring through in, in the spring. A lot of those birds are coming up from Central America, South America, and Mexico, and they come up right up through the middle of the country, if you can think of the geography. So Chicago is actually the city that's closest to that big river of birds, and we're putting out so much light, and light attracts birds, so we have uh, an enormous number of migrating birds. What are some threats that the birds that migrate through here or that live here, what are some threats that they face? Right now, the biggest threat is climate change. You know, that's a new one and it just multiplies every other threat. Birds are migrating, they're relying on the trees to be just leaping out uh, so that the insects will be attracted to them and that timing is very specific and it's been that way, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years. But it's all changing now. The, the trees are leafing out sooner because it's warmer. So some birds are adapting by moving their nesting time up and others aren't. But then you have the, you have the other threats. The buildings, I think, in Chicago are huge. We have many, many glass buildings and 
thousands of birds um, every migration season are running into those buildings and dying. Our organization, along with other local organizations, are working to get an ordinance passed that will require buildings built in Chicago to be bird friendly. Judy, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us. Solar energy has become a hot topic in recent years, with many people pushing for individuals and entities to adopt its use. But how exactly does it work? Here's Hannah Shapiro with more. Energy. It's what makes us move. And what's the ultimate source of energy? That makes plants grow, provides animals and humans the vitamins needed to thrive, and now can even power post-industrialized society? The sun. For a long time, we've run on fossil fuels, putting our planet in an increasingly precarious situation. Weather patterns are changing, and the global temperature is rising. So now, we're looking for cleaner alternatives. Today, we established the nation's leading climate action plan, including becoming the first Midwest state to require 100% carbon-free energy by 2045. Here in Illinois, Governor Pritzker signed the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act in September. The act will fund initiatives that stop and reverse environmental damages causing climate change, including the expansion of solar energy. Illinois schools, businesses, apartment buildings, skyscrapers, and houses are using it. But how does solar work? It's just kind of magical how you can generate electricity from sunlight. That's Jay Futterman. He's a solar ambassador with the Illinois Solar Education Association. I do a lot of uh, educational events, uh, talk about home solar, uh, do webinars, home solar tours, and things like that. Jay explained how solar works at his house in the north suburbs. We have our solar panels up on the roof and when the sun is out it generates electricity. That electricity is in the DC form and in our houses we use AC electricity. So there's an inverter on the side of the house. The inverter changes that DC to AC and then it goes in through the service panel in the basement just like it would through the power lines from the utility. And when we turn the lights on or turn on our toaster oven, if the sun is shining, we know that all that electricity is coming from the sun. Right now, today, we're making a lot more electricity than we're using. So all that excess electricity is actually getting pumped out onto the grid, and it's going into our neighbors' houses right now. Illinois gets plenty of sunshine in the summer. And in the months when we don't, there's something called net metering that keeps solar-powered homes running. The way that uh, the solar policy works in Illinois is if you're making excess energy, it goes out onto the grid, and the utility keeps track of how much energy you're putting onto the grid. And it sort of builds up in your account, and then at night or in the winter months, you could draw down from that account. You store credit for excess energy produced, and then apply that credit during times of less production. It's like a piggy bank for energy. Take a look at Jay's energy bill. Uh, zero dollars and zero cents is what we owe. That's zero dollars. The energy bills are low, but the upfront cost to install solar panels can be significant. That's where state and federal incentives come into play. They help lower that barrier to entry. ComEd Solar Calculator is a great tool to begin exploring if solar is a good option for your location and your wallet. And for folks whose housing situations aren't suited for panels, community solar programs make solar energy accessible for renters and multifamily home dwellers. Even if climate is not one of your concerns, Solar really is the cheapest way to get electricity in Illinois. So not going solar you know, means that you're actively choosing to pay more for energy that's destroying the planet. To learn more about solar energy, visit Illinois Solar Education Association's website. With summer in full swing, Chicagoans are eager to spend time outside. Now, we give you a look at this week's weather. Friday, sunny and 75 with a west wind coming five to 10 miles per hour from the north in the afternoon. Friday night, mostly clear with a low around 56. Northeast wind coming around very calmly in the evening. Saturday, partly sunny with a high of nearly 64. Saturday night, we might see some showers, mostly cloudy with a low of 58. Wind is very low, only 10 miles per hour. Sunday, a chance of showers with thunderstorms also possible after 4 p.m. Partly sunny with a high of near 69. Chance of precipitation is 40%. 
Sunday night, another chance of showers with thunderstorms, mostly cloudy with a low around 59. So we're just gonna see some showers throughout this week. Hopefully after this week, Mother Nature will give us some sunshine for the summer. Throughout this episode, we will feature brief moments capturing the natural world in Chicago. For this moment, here are the sights, sounds, and fauna of Washington Park. Don't go anywhere just yet. We've got more stories after the break. We explain the spread of green roofs in Chicago, and we talk to a local business that's growing mushrooms in a sustainable manner. We'll be right back. At Northwestern University, we are pioneering innovation and achieving excellence across every imaginable discipline. University, the possibilities are endless. Every day across America, excess food is gathered by a network of good people at local food banks, giving hope to millions of children who struggle with hunger. They've earned their wings, and you can too. Together, we can solve child hunger. Support Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. Cook foods to the right temperature using a food thermometer. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. Have you ever wondered why some roofs in the city are covered in grass or vegetation? Green roofs have several benefits and help make cities healthier and more eco-friendly. Here's Mary Chapel. If you stand atop some of the tallest buildings in Chicago and you look closely, you'll notice that a number of the structures have green roofs. And if you're going for a stroll in Millennium Park, you probably don't realize you're standing on one of the world's largest green roofs. Chicago is a leading city in having green roofs. A study in 2013 found the city had more than 500, totaling more than 5 million square feet of vegetation. This is the green roof at the Chicago Botanic Garden. It was built in 2009. It has two pods, each 16,000 square feet. It serves as a living lab for research and education. Richard Hockey, the director of ornamental plant research, said there are many benefits to having a green roof in addition to providing habitats for wildlife. The reasons you would do a green roof, uh, the environmental, it catches water, it controls water runoff. There's a, a, an economical benefit. The, a green roof um, lasts longer than a conventional roof, so the lifespan is longer, I think up to seven times longer. Hockey also says, perhaps most importantly, Green roofs eliminate the heat island effect. Heat islands are urban areas that are hotter due to buildings and streets absorbing and remitting the heat into the atmosphere. Green roofs help to cool their surrounding areas down. Chicago City Hall has one of the most famous green roofs, planted in 2000 under former Mayor Richard M. Daley. The garden was part of the city's urban heat island initiative. City Hall shares a building with the Cook County Administrative Building. But if you go up to the roof, the, the city side is a green roof. And the county side is just a traditional roof. And so, you know, if you look at the way water is managed up there, you look at the temperature difference between run, one, run roof and the other. I mean, you can't get a better example of why a green roof makes sense. Across town, on common ground, a restaurant in Edgewater grows its own food while reaping the benefits of a green roof. It was the first certified organic rooftop farm in the country when it opened in 2008. The farm sits on a 2,500 square foot deck where farmers harvest all kinds of fresh produce. Our produce is delicious and fresh and wonderful uh, and it doesn't have any kind of carbon footprint to get down to our, our restaurant itself. People come from all over the world to look at our rooftop farm. Uncommon Ground ranked as the greenest restaurant in America in 2011. 
we have led a lot of people in the same direction that we're in and there's tons of places that have surpassed us now and that's wonderful you know like we want to see that happen we want to be inspirational for other people to kind of follow suit i even got to try some of the produce for myself so here i am on the rooftop garden i'm going to try some oroch it's like a salty spinach should i just bite into it yeah go for it delicious we hope you're enjoying our program so far here's another moment in nature this is Humboldt Park in Chicago's west side. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way. What's up, man? You left some leaves burning out here. Yeah, I, I just, I, there was a, I had, just came in just for a second. Come on, man. If it's too hot to touch, it's too hot to leave. You could torch the whole neighborhood. It's a good point there, smoke. Key. Nine out of ten wildfires are caused by humans. Only you can prevent wildfires. Go, you Northwest. Go, Northwest and break right through the Cheer you all the go. Go, you Northwestern, fight for the drop, sweet victory, for the fame of our fair name, and go, Northwestern, win that game. Go, cats! Chicago has beautiful pockets of nature in its parks, but the city is not immune to environmental damage. To learn more about environmental issues impacting Chicago, Mackenzie Richmond brings us an expert's perspective. Hi, Mackenzie. Many of us go through each day taking the air we breathe for granted. But did you know that one of the greatest environmental issues Chicago residents face is poor air quality? Just last year, the matte asphalt plant of Chicago's McKinley Park neighborhood accumulated the highest number of air pollution complaints of any address in the city. According to data collected by Purple Air Sensors, air quality index has nearly tripled from baseline air quality since plant operations began in 2018. Matt Asphalt owner Michael Tadden Jr. claimed the plant had lower emissions and is farther away from parks and homes than other asphalt plants within the city. You know, we're not really comparing it to are they under the limits that the Illinois EPA has set. We're comparing it to is it safe? Or, you know, and we're comparing it to the fact that it was zero from them before they showed up. And, uh, you know, it's a substantial increase from zero. The city's air is monitored by two variations of air monitors, both installed and monitored by parties outside of city officials. Neighbors for Environmental Justice has self-installed and monitored six air monitors around the city. As far as the city's involvement, no. The city has not done anything uh, to help with our air monitoring situation. Um, they do not require air monitoring at Matt Asphalt or any of the other asphalt plants in the city. Since air pollution is not a tangible or entirely visible hazard, many overlook the risk. Air pollution is often kind of treated as an invisible thing. You know, it's something that it's like, they might feel like, ah, it's kind of smoky out today or, you know, it smells weird or whatever, but it doesn't necessarily feel quantifiable. What can be quantifiable are the risks to the residents living in these regions. Um, an increase of one microgram per cubic meter um, in an area was correlated with uh, a 20% increase in the number of daily suicides. Further studies have demonstrated impacts on academic performance. Um, they did studies that even in the same zip code, 
you know, where it's like a very similar, obviously, like, you know, kids are living in the same neighborhood, but it's like if one of them is upwind of a facility and the other one is downwind of a facility, um, the kids who are going to school downwind will have a worse academic performance. And we want people to think about it as like, this is something that is affecting you. You know, I mean, we were just talking about kind of how there is no safe level of air pollution, right? Like, you know, once you can start to understand the kinds of risks that are going on there, um, you can take a greater interest in, in the air quality in your neighborhood. Businesses are also getting involved with promoting sustainable practices. Here in Chicago, that includes the beer industry. Elise Devlin has the latest on this story. Let's just say you finished a six pack of beer with your friends, you're looking to throw out your garbage. Let me guess, you recycle. After all, it does say 100% recyclable. Yet if you live in a city like Chicago, that isn't exactly true. I'm here with Josh Gilbert, founder of Temperance Beer Company in Evanston, to discuss how Chicago breweries are addressing this issue and looking out for the environment. Cheers. <laughs> Plastic can carriers and six pack film rings are not easily recyclable in most states throughout the U.S. But this is where Alex Parker comes in. We want to make sure that these beer can carriers are uh, reused and properly recycled. About 88% of them actually end up in the landfill, even if people try to recycle them. Parker has rallied local breweries to join in on spreading the word about this and to approach recycling in a new way that actually works. One of these breweries is Temperance Beer Company in Evanston. We were always trying to minimize our impact because brewing is a very resource intensive, especially, um, you know, like gas for the boiler to heat up the water and the water for cleaning and brewing the beer. So then when Alex contacted me and sort of, you know, educated me, everybody here bought into it immediately. It's nice to have faith that these will actually be recycled and people can once again go back to rinsing out their plastic and, and actually recycling them instead of throwing them in the garbage. Aside from this alternative recycling method spreading around Chicago, anyone can start participating. We say bring them back to the brewery. That's the best thing you can do. And if your local brewery doesn't accept them, ask them if they will. There is a better way and uh, the, the best way to deal with these can carriers is to simply bring them back to the brewery. Uh, there they can be reused, they can be properly recycled because we have a recycling partner um, called the Resource Center based in Chicago that is going to make sure that these things end up um, being properly recycled rather than going to the landfill. By taking part, you can help the environment and you can help yourself to some free beer. What you get for bringing back your pack tech or your plastic can carrier is not only feeling good about yourself and what you're doing to protect the environment, but also you're getting beer. So let's say you bring back three, you get that much beer in your glass. If you bring back more, so that's how much beer. I don't know, that's probably about two, three ounces. So you wanna get, we'll do it up to a pint, um, which is probably about that tall. And then you'll just have to bring them back some other day. Our reporter, Rafael Hipils, also got to talk to the people building the Chicago Park District's very first hummingbird habitat. Take a look. Really appreciate your help coming out. This area, we are installing a bunch of plants that are especially liked by hummingbirds. Every fourth Saturday of the month, volunteers come here to Washington Park to help clean or perform work for the betterment of the park. Right now, volunteers are planting flowers and plants that will help for the future hummingbird habitat. The construction of the habitat, which is located in the southeast corner of Washington Park's lagoon, is led by the Chicago Audubon Society in coordination with the Chicago Park District. We're hoping to um, basically provide a feeding station for the ruby-throated hummingbirds as they come through on migration um, through Chicago. Uh, the little hummingbirds migrate all the way from Central America. Um, up here, when they get here, um, they've lost a lot of weight. I'm talking about like um, more than half their body weight, or almost half their body weight, and so they get here and they need um, flowers to, to feed. And we pulled together a group of local birders, and we all sort, sort of sat around and thought about what would be the best, um, the best thing to do for birds here, and we came up with a hummingbird garden because it's really engaging to a lot of people. It's a way that a lot of people can understand how important the park is for birds. We have tons of uh, volunteers, but basically people walk by and say, what are you doing, you know? And so we can kind of engage them. We may do some impromptu bird walks. 
Pollock estimates that the garden should be ready for the hummingbirds once they arrive to the city later this summer. We can't take it for granted. Um, and the fact that the parks aren't just a recreational space for us as humans, um, but there's many other inhabitants and we need to make sure that we can all thrive. Mushrooms aren't the first thing that come to mind when you think of farming. And farming isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Chicago. But one local company has found a way to grow mushrooms in a sustainable way right here in the city. Here's Meng Hao Xiao with more. I'm Sean DeJoya and I'm the COO here at Four Star Mushrooms. And I'm Joe Weber. I'm the founder of Four Star Mushrooms. Ultimately, I started this business because I'm very concerned about climate change and the loss of biodiversity. And I see mushrooms as one of the ways that we can really impact both of those issues positively, um, both by sequestering carbon and ultimately creating ecosystems. Mushrooms play a really unique role in the environment, um, in particularly in nutrient cycling, as they're a really interesting interface between life and death, and they're responsible for decomposing a lot of the dead um, materials and nutrients that are in in various landscapes and ecosystems and mushrooms will actually break down dead or dying material and allow for new life to grow from there. We have a collaboration with Urban Produce and Urban Produce is a urban farm on the west side of Chicago. They've been taking our spent mushroom blocks. Um, once we're no longer utilizing them in our grow room, we'll actually bring them over to Urban Produce and urban produce will actually take them, they'll compost them, and they'll leave them on their site, and then they'll use them in their raised beds later on in that year and get to plant directly into those. And they, they've actually compared using our spent substrate as to beds where they did not use it at all um, and have had really positive beneficial impacts to their soil health. Our business plan in the long run is ultimately to bring regenerative agriculture to the large scale scene. We see ourselves growing all sorts of different mushrooms, mushrooms that have never even been cultivated before. Um, and then using that spent substrate, pooling together various waste from all sorts of different industries, um, whether it's our local neighbors in the neighborhood or whether it's agricultural partners at large scale. Um, training our mushrooms to grow on that given substrate and then from there we'll be able to use the spent substrate for various remediation and soil restoration projects to do ultimately do regenerative agriculture at a large scale um, and begin to take take land that is really bare of topsoil and is bare of any sort of life at all and bring biodiversity back to that land and ultimately sequester carbon through our agriculture system. And that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed our show. We leave you with one final moment in nature. This is Montrose Point Bird Sanctuary on the north side. Have a great day.